This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Is it possible to connect these nine dots, assuming the rules are, one, you must use four straight line segments, and two, you cannot take your pencil off the paper? This is probably one of the most famous connect the dots puzzles that people rarely get at first, if at all. They'll try things like this, which doesn't work because you missed the one in the middle, or they'll try this, which also doesn't work. They'll conclude it must be impossible, and then are surprised to find it is possible with this configuration here. It just involves some out of the box thinking, no pun intended. Or here's another puzzle. Is it possible to cover this entire 10 by 10 grid with four by one tiles? Assuming you can only place the tiles vertically or horizontally and there can't be any overlap or anything like that. Now you could just start trying combinations, but again, try to look at this in a different way. If we were to write down the number one on the top corner and then twos down the first diagonal, then threes, fours, ones again, twos, and so on, we can find something interesting. No matter where you put the tile, assuming only vertical and horizontal orientations, it will cover the numbers one, two, three, and four every time. Since there are 100 squares here, that means we need 25 tiles to cover everything, thus 25 ones, 25 twos, 25 threes, and 25 fours would need to be covered. But if we count everything up, there's not 25 of each number. For example, there are 26 twos, and that would require 26 tiles, which would be too much to fit on this grid, thus the original problem is impossible. See, for some of these problems, you just have to take on a new perspective. Although the questions are simple and the math isn't that advanced, solutions to these aren't always obvious. So let's see another example. Imagine a classroom of 25 students arranged in a 5x5 grid where each student occupies a single one of these spaces. And as a quick definition, I need to add that two students are adjacent if they share an edge, as in diagonals do not count as adjacent. So these two students are adjacent since they share an edge, and same goes for these two, but these two are not, they're just diagonal. Now, let's say some of these students become infected with a disease, and on top of this, every minute the disease spreads according to the following two rules. One, if you're already infected, you'll remain infected. And two, if you're adjacent to at least two infected students, you become infected as well. That means in the next minute, this person will become infected since they were adjacent to two infected students sharing both those edges. Same goes for this person here since they're adjacent to three infected people. And here are all the rest. By the way, I'm just writing the subscript two here to visually show you like this is the next round of people who got infected so we don't lose track. Doesn't mean anything else though. Then after another minute, the same thing would happen. Now all these students would become infected. After another round, these X4 squares will become infected and eventually everyone becomes infected. So here comes the math problem. The question is, for this five x five grid, is it possible to start with four or fewer infected students and get to a point where the entire class, AKA every square is infected? If you wanna give this some thought, pause the video now, cause I'm just going to say the answer. And that is no, this is impossible. But the tough part is to prove why. This is actually question three from problem set two of an MIT course called Mathematics for Computer Science, which by the way is a really interesting class. It's available totally for free online, like textbook lectures and everything included. So I'll link that below for those who are interested. But anyway, the question as stated is actually more general than what I said. It asks for a proof that for any n by n grid, if fewer than n students are initially infected, then the whole class will never be completely infected. I'm just going more specific for simplicity. Now, even though this question is found here in a college level math class, the underlying math is extremely simplistic, just not obvious at first. So let's go back. Again, I'll deal with a five by five board and the goal is to show that if we start with four infected students or fewer, that the entire class will never become infected. As with several math questions that seem tough at first, sometimes it can be helpful to just play around with it. Like let's see what happens here. First, these students become infected as they're all adjacent to at least two already infected students. Then next, these students become infected. And lastly, this one does, but that's it. All these other squares are adjacent to only one infected student. Like this one here shares only one of those edges and thus the disease does not spread to them. In this case, it looks like we couldn't quite get the boundary. So, okay, let's try again, but use these four spots instead. Now the first round leads to these students being infected, followed by these, 
and then one more remains and it ends here. Still, we can't get everyone. In fact, you'll notice that even if we were to start with more than five infected students, like this right here, that may not lead to the entire class being infected, but that's not our goal. So in order to figure this out, we'll start with this grid, and the first thing we're gonna do is count how many edges border a single infected student. Like this edge borders a single infected student, and same with all these four around them. And the same applies to this one here, and all these around the perimeter. We don't count this one, for example, because it borders two infected students. So right now we've highlighted 12 edges, and that will be considered the boundary or perimeter of the infected region. The thing to note is that if everyone becomes infected, then the boundary would have to have a length of 20. So now let's see how the boundary evolves. If two infected students are adjacent to a healthy one, then the boundary length is not going to change. Right now the boundary has a length of 8. Then after the student gets infected, we remove these two edges, but add one to the top and one to the bottom, thus keeping the total number of edges at 8. Same goes for this situation here. Right now the perimeter is 8, and after the spread the perimeter is still 8. Nothing changes with the perimeter length when two infected students are adjacent to a healthy one. But what about three infected students surrounding a healthy one? Well in this case the perimeter is 12 to begin. Once that middle student becomes infected, we remove three of the edges and add in one. So the perimeter goes to 10, meaning it decreased by two. Now I know these two students become infected as well, but those squares are only adjacent to two infected students each, which as we just saw doesn't change anything. As in when we create the new boundary, it will still have a length of 10. It decreased by two, but that only happened because of this student here becoming infected. And lastly, what if four infected students border a healthy one? Well, now the perimeter starts at 16, and after the spread, these four edges in the middle just go away, decreasing the perimeter by four. Again, yes, these ones become infected as well, but due to what we've already discussed, the overall boundary still goes down by four, remaining at 12, due to that one student in the middle. So we can finally put this all together. If a healthy person is adjacent to two infected people, the perimeter does not change. If adjacent to three infected students, the perimeter goes down by two, and if adjacent to four infected students, the perimeter goes down by four. As we can see, the perimeter cannot go up. So when four people start out as infected, the perimeter is at most 16, and it could be less. But for everyone to be infected, the perimeter would need to go to 20, thus it would need to increase, which we just saw is impossible. What we just found was an invariance, or something that doesn't change as the system evolves. And in math, sometimes finding that invariant can be the toughest part. Compare that to like an introductory physics class where we're often told the thing that stays constant, like momentum is conserved or energy is conserved, and we have to analyze the system overall with that information. In this case, it can be harder to find the thing that stays constant, but once you do, it allows you to really understand how the system will evolve over time because we know what's not changing. Now, this next puzzle doesn't involve an invariant in the same way that the last one did but it does require you to analyze the system for what may or may not change as the system evolves. In this game, we're going to try to catch a thief. Imagine a network of cities connected as shown where someone has just stolen some money from a bank in this city. You are located here and have been assigned to catch the person, but the rule is you have to take turns moving and you can only move along one edge at a time. Same goes for them. If you have to move first, the question is, is it possible to catch the thief? Well, if you try, it kind of seems impossible. If you move up, they could move down, and this cycle could continue, which of course leads nowhere. You could chase it in a circle, which does nothing. And even if you guys venture out to other cities, it seems like there's no way for you to land in the same city as them at the same time. But in fact, there is a way to catch them, and the secret lies in this city here. First thing we can do with this network is label all the nodes either red or blue, such that any two connected cities have different colors. The only exception is this city here, which cannot be blue or red, otherwise it would connect to its own color. So we'll leave that one neutral. Now when we start to chase, both players are on the same color. But when you have to make a move, you have to change to the other color, and this will always be the case. Thus, you can't catch them, because you'll always land on a different color, and thus a different city, which is why the chase seems pointless. But this city here changes that. Because now after you go buy it, your next move will land you on the same color as the thief. 
It seems strange, but that neutral city is like a portal you go through that completely flips the state of the game to one you can win. And now since you'll always land on their color, you can just kind of pin them into a corner, which forces them to make a move that allows you to capture them. Now, on this topic of graph theory, let's see another puzzle that's pretty famous. Let's say there's a house that consists of five rooms plus an outside area. Now, on every single wall, there's a door linking the two adjacent rooms, and yes, outside counts as a room, meaning there are 16 doors in total. Now, assume that when you walk through a door, it closes behind you, and you can never reopen it. The question is simple. Can you close every single door, assuming you can start wherever you want? And yes, the only way to close the door, by the way, is walking through it. Again, this would be a pretty tough question to just brute force, so we gotta find some way to cleverly represent the system. Now, I'm just gonna get to the answer, pause if you don't wanna know it, but the answer is no, you cannot walk through every door. As you can see in this example, we still have two doors open that we just can't get to. Now, the reason this is impossible to do is directly related to why we cannot draw this shape without taking our pencil off the paper or going over the same edge twice. You can try it if you want, but it is impossible to do and we'll see why. To understand this, let's first start by trying to draw the shape. If I start with a vertex and draw an edge to make another one, we find that both vertices are of course connected to one edge. Thus, they both have a degree of one. Now, if we keep going and make another edge, then this vertex here now has a degree of two, while the others have a degree of one. If we add another edge, then two nodes have a degree of two, while the others are one. If we connect back to an already made vertex, then these are the degrees. Notice that in every case, two of the degrees are odd and the rest are even. And on top of that, the odd degrees are at the first node we started with and the one we end at. This happens because when you trace to a new node, it will have a degree of one automatically, but then when you leave it, it will have a degree of two for those two edges. So these all come in even pairs. The only exception is this last node since you haven't left it yet, and the first one because you only left it so far. However, it's when you connect to the starting node that everything will have an even degree. But once you keep drawing, you get those two odd degrees again at the starting and ending points while the rest are even. This is all that can happen. Notice my attempt to draw the shape on the left failed because now I can't connect these vertices with this edge since I left my pencil here and I can't pick it up or retrace over an already made edge. So in general, in order to draw a shape, again, without taking your pencil off the paper or going over the same edge twice, either every vertex must have an even degree or exactly two vertices have an odd degree while the rest are even. But in the second case, you must start and end at the two nodes with odd degrees. And this is all assuming the graph is connected, by the way. So this explains why that shape on the left isn't possible to draw in the way that we want. Since these are the degree values of each vertex, we see there's more than two odd degrees, which goes against both of these rules at the bottom. Now going back to the original problem, what we can do is treat all the rooms as nodes, and this includes outdoors being one node. Then the doors can be thought of as edges that connect them like you can see here. So the question of can I walk through every door is the same as saying, can I draw this shape without going over the same edge twice and without taking my pencil off the paper? And you'll note that going over the same edge twice would be like going through a door twice, which isn't allowed, and taking your pencil off the paper would be like teleporting, which we can't do. But anyway, if we find the degree of each node, these come out to be the values, and since there's more than two odd degrees, then this is impossible to draw given our conditions, thus no, you cannot walk through every single door. If you want another challenge though, we can add a twist where we introduce a hole in this room that connects to the outside area. As in now you can go from that room to outside or vice versa whenever you want, although you still have to close all the doors. Now is this possible to do? The answer to this one is yes, and here's why. If I start in the room on the top left and walk to the right, we close that door, which if you look at the graph above, is like removing that edge and being faced with a totally new puzzle, where those degrees that were each five go down to four. So now we see there are exactly two nodes with an odd degree, so our goal is possible. If we were starting in one of those rooms with the odd degree, remember that second rule from before. But since we're not, we still have an issue. 
However, now we can walk through the top door, which closes it and removes that edge from the graph above. Then we're able to go through the hole back into the top room, which doesn't change the graph at all. Now the graph has exactly two odd degree nodes, but we're starting at one of them, meaning there is a solution and it will for sure have us end in this room here with the degree of five. And I'll just have him trace out the path where you will see that is exactly what happens. So really we found that this five room puzzle cannot be accomplished on a flat plane, but it can be accomplished on a torus or donut, because the hole in the middle would be in one room, and that would be a link to the outside area, which this website has a good graphic showing. Now in that last example, we were most concerned about the degree of each node, but now I'm going to make a graph where we keep track of how many nodes or vertices and edges there are. Like here we have two vertices and a single edge that connects them. With the next trace, that adds one node and one edge to the graph, and same with the next. But once we connect the two already existing nodes, we add one edge, but now we also add a face, which I'll add a column for. And something to realize here is that in every case, the vertices minus edges plus faces is always one. However, if we were to call this outer section a face as well, then that increases the number of faces in every case by one changing the total to two. This relationship of vertices minus edges plus faces is one of the most famous invariants in mathematics known as Euler's characteristic. Some mathematicians put this near the top of their list of the most beautiful equations out there due to its simplicity, but also its surprising applications. So instead of just trying to throw in one example to this video, I'm gonna do an entire dedicated one just for that. But for those who want to continue learning about math, science, technology, and more, I recommend checking out CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video. CuriosityStream is a streaming service that hosts thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles spanning history, physics and the universe, technology, nature, and plenty more. If you want to learn more about groundbreaking physics and the search for a theory of everything, they have series like The Ultimate Formula that will take you through the discovery of the Higgs boson all the way to our understanding of what happens at the center of a black hole. Or they have series just on illusions that will explain why our brains don't always see things for what they truly are. CuriosityStream is an extremely affordable streaming service at only $2.99 a month that will satisfy anyone with a strong desire to learn, explore, and just understand the world and universe around us. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more. Then if you go to curiositystream.com slash majorprep or click the link below and use the promo code majorprep, you'll get your first month's membership completely free. This gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series that I know many of you will find very interesting. So again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit the bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.